Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful Sunday evening. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, the Packers didn't win. It was close, but they didn't win today. But you know what? Give kudos to Tom Brady. Tom Brady seems to be just the man because all of a sudden he is bringing the Buccaneers um, to the Super Bowl when they haven't been there since 2003. So congratulations to him. But also, um, I want to give condolences out as well to Hank Aaron, the legendary uh, baseball player who had passed away two days ago at the age of 86 years old, as well as condolences to Larry King, the legendary uh, talk show host who succumbed to COVID. Um, rest in peace to both of them and condolences to the families as well. Um, today's episode is brought to you by iHeartRadio. Um, you can see and hear all of the episodes of the Sherrard Show on iHeartRadio. Um, just add it to your, your smart device, or you can go ahead and um, watch it on television and see all the greatest episodes, including this one on iHeartRadio, or listen to them as a podcast. And then also on Essence Television. Essence Television is a new home for the Sherrard Show. It's actually my network, so I'm so excited. And you can see the best episodes from the Isley Brothers, Michael Collier. We just had Mitch Perry on the show. I'm so excited. As well as um, you're going to see the Eagles and um, Art Garfunk and all of the greatest episodes you'll see right there on Essence Television. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this particular episode is one of the special ones um, that you don't want to miss because I have a very special dear friend of mine. This lady is the author of a book, One More River, The Redemption of Sam Cooke. She actually has two copies of it, as you see it on your monitor. She has a volume one as well as a volume two. And then she's also the author of Love is a Hurting Thing, uh, the Lana and Lou Rawls story. I, I must buy. You can purchase them on, on Amazon. Um, she can get you an autographed copy as well. She's a humble lady that has done so much investigating on a topic that we're going to be speaking about tonight, and that is the true story on the murder of Sam Cooke. Welcome to the Sherrod Show, BG. How are you this evening? Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> I've been promising so, you to be on for a long time, and I'm just, I'm always busy. You're so, so busy. To... You're so busy. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I could have a better shot of getting Joe Biden on the show than you. You're so busy. It's un <laughs> you probably it's can. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But I'm honored to have you on to have a, uh, you. to give a portion of your time this evening. Now, BG, um, let's start, jump right into it. There is, uh, Sam Cooke is now a hot topic again. It seemed like it's been 57 years since his murder, but yet it's never been out fully out of the minds of people. Mm -hmm. And tell me, what is the reason why that his murder lingers on even almost 60 years later? Well, because it was a cover-up. And, you know, you, you have to go back through the lens of history and think about December 1964 in this country. That is before, uh, it was right after the Civil Rights Act uh, was 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 passed, but it was uh, before a lot of other legislation was passed. We still didn't have fair housing, for example. Um, and if you look at where our country is now and what we just went through a couple of weeks ago, you could see how divided this country still is on race. So now go back to that time period, right? And it's not that it was better, it was far worse. It's just hard to believe. And so what happened was um, in the case of Sam Cooke and not just Sam Cooke, but many other artists, um, their murders were covered up because what you had were police departments that worked in tandem with many top mobsters. And the mob, you know, the mob really ran this country until the 80s when there was a federal crackdown. And uh, Sam's manager, uh, Alan Klein, was a middleman. He wasn't the guy. Um, he was a protege of Morris Levy. And if you've ever read the Tommy James, you know, Tommy James and the Shondells, if you've ever read his book, uh, The Mob, The Music, and Me, he details what it was like working for this man. I mean, this was a, this was a guy who ruled by baseball bat, right? If you asked where your copyright money was, you didn't ask a second time because you would end up like Shep Shepard of the Limelighters, if you remember the song Daddy's Home. Yeah, he, he but he died of mysterious circumstances in 19. It was not mysterious at all. He was he was killed. Le he went to Levy and asked, where's his money? And Levy said, well, you, you've got all the money you're going to get. And so he tried to take Levy to court. 
And then he ended up dead inside of his car on the Long Island Expressway. But and they, everybody, everybody they, knew. But they called it a robbery. No, there was no robbery. <laughs> well, the wow. robbery, well, the robbery is that Levy stole his copyrights. That's the robbery. That's the same robbery as Alan Klein. You know, see, see, here's let me go back a little bit with Sam Cook. So this is how they did it, just just so that we're clear. They had okay, Sam Giancana and Vito Genovese were the biggest mobsters. The had the largest syndicates and basically ran the music industry in this country. Genovese even ran it from his jail cell. That's how powerful he was. He could pay the cards and do what he needed to do. And if somebody was getting to be, you know, up and coming and kind of a, oh, you know, looking very lucrative, they swooped in and they had a bag man find out who, who was their inner circle, who were the people that were helping them run the labels. In, in, Sam case, in Sam's case, he owned his own labels, Sars and Derby and Kags Publishing, which by the way, was named for Lou Rawls's uh, stepfather, Kags. Um, very colorful guy. <laughs> it's a long story with him if you read the book on Lou Rawls. But anyway, Sam sort of admired him and named his publishing after him. Well, what he did is he had J.W. Alexander, who was Sam's labels partner, go to Reno, which was a totally unlicensed situation in those days. And I uh, have interviewed um, legal professionals in, in Vegas who said that it was just loosey-goosey then. So if somebody shows up and they have a forged copy of the titles of operation and it's a black man and he says, I'm Sam Cook." clerk just stamps it and here it is and there you go and Sam found out about this just a couple of days before he ended up dead um, he was going to fire Klein um, he was going to divorce his wife I mean the family knew this I talked to a number of people uh, who were very clear on this um, Billy Davis who played guitar for Hank Ballard was good friends with Sam. He was in Sam's apartment. They were sort of living separate lives. So this is how they did it. They, they got somebody on the inside to drive a wedge. And then um, in, in, in the case of Sam, the police department, when they come across a body in which there's just a sport jacket and one shoe, that's a notice to the mo to the from the mob to the police do not investigate so here we had the fire chief showing up from you know rampart division police officers showing up 77th division showing up and they know this is a mob hit and the fire chief told his family this guy had a going over he may not have even died from a gunshot wound. It might have been he died from injuries from a beating. Everybody who was at Sam's first funeral in Chicago saw that. I mean, his head was almost off of his neck. I don't mean to be gross, but that's just basically what his family said. Now, the right you, side of his face was- Let me interrupt you for one sec, BG, for those who yeah. are just tuning in to sure, us sure. and want to kind of catch up on a few things. Yeah, now, I'm probably um, getting ahead here. Yeah, because I want to be able to, um, to, to inform people about a couple of things because so many people who were living during that time as well as those who are living now they all know they all feel that on december 11th he went to a he went to hacienda uh, motel with um elijah boyer the prostitute um which was not turned, even a real name <laughs> exactly and it turns out that um you know sam there was a legend that he went there and to rape her and people don't people don't understand that hacienda motel is in the was in the worst side of town it was a truck stop 10 cents a night um sam cook would never even be caught dead there unfortunately he was caught dead there but that was not um the way it went and then also um, why would sam cook ever have to rape anybody um he was sam cook etc but the thing is that um that rumor has been going on for so long so tonight we are going to expose that and dispel it um again we're talking to a legendary author the lovely uh, bg rule who is the writer the author of one more river the redemption of sam cook you got to purchase this book um as well now um bg there has been a lot of people who have 
uh, attempted to investigate what happened with Sam Cooke, but they got mysterious phone calls. They got threatening phone calls. They got calls from sources to say, we know where your children go to school, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Sam's, uh, let's see, his sister Agnes was uh, married to a Cook County investigator and the family investigated. Uh, Muhammad Ali was a close friend of Sam's and was at the repast. He knew that it didn't go down the way that the police said, and he was going to hire a private investigator and he was threatened with the loss of his boxing career if he got involved. That's, that's, that's how you know this was serious. So the family got phone calls and they knew that the phone calls were coming from Klein and from Klein's people. And they did tell them, we know where your kids mm -hmm. go to school. And it was very frightening. And Sam's father didn't want anybody else to get killed. He said, just let it rest. None of this is gonna bring Sam back, you know. But, uh, but Agnes's husband decided that he was gonna just do this on the down low. And what they discovered was that indeed the titles of operation had been changed that he had traced this to Reno and that there was, there was a titles of operation that had had Sam's father listed as the officer so that if anything happened to Sam, the family would always be covered. Sam always took care of his family. His daughter told me he basically was taking care of the whole family. And he you know, was a real believer in, in black entrepreneurialism of Malcolm X, but he was a Baptist you know, at the same time. And I'm gonna move this into uh, the other room here because my son is coming downstairs here. So sorry, <laughs> be unprofessional. Okay. Uh, but anyway, long story short. So um, they did threaten him and he was undeterred and they did find these titles and uh, and that was just sort of the first thread being pulled where they knew that that this whole thing was just very, very crooked. Now, now BG, um, many will ask and are asking this question right now. Why would Alan Klein want to kill Sam Cooke? What did he do to make him want to um, kill him? Now, first of all, well, because he, okay, Alan Klein's, Sam Cooke wasn't the end game. Sam Cooke was the beginning. His end game was the British invasion. The money was for him to manage the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. That's what he wanted. How did he get to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones when most people had not ever heard of him? Because Alan Klein was so mobbed up, he could not get an accountant's license in the state of New York. And when he, when he I'm gonna jump ahead just a second. And when he did approach the Beatles, Paul McCartney's father-in-law, Lee Eastman, had found that out about him. Now, Eastman wasn't that clean himself because he ended up working for Liberty and they were a very mobbed up organization, but they knew who Klein was and he thought it was in Paul's best interest not to, not to, to sort of sever ties with Apple. So to get back to Sam Cooke, he used Sam Cooke's blood money to approach the Beatles and then the Rolling Stones and other groups and to say, let me manage you. And he said, you know, see, Sam did not have a contract with Klein. Sam didn't even call him his manager. He said he had people who were working for him. The reason he hired Klein who had approached him after a show one night, late 63, was because Klein offered him better bookings. He could get onto shows like Mike Douglas and The Tonight Show and Sam wanted to go back to the COPA where in 1958, he, he didn't have really the best experience. He was sort of a little green and didn't really, mm -hmm. you know, he had a different arranger. And this time he would have Renee Hall, the percussionist, and he just did a fantastic job, you know, in the arrangements. And he was gonna sing bass and street blues. Now they're telling a myth in one night in Miami that a change is going to come was performed on the Tonight Show. That I saw that. Happened. I saw that. That never happened. Never happened. And in fact, it angered me. And I'll tell you why. I wrote about a change is going to come for the Library of Congress at their invitation. The people I know there in the music blogs. 
When Sam wrote A Change is Gonna Come, he was inspired to write something for Dr. King for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That song was for Dr. King. Sam never wanted to make any money on that song. That's why you didn't see it out the whole time Sam was alive. He recorded it in 1963. So what happened in 1964, two weeks after Sam died, Klein stuck it on the backside of the song Shake. What does that tell you about Klein's ethics right there? He was only and out his, for the money. Disrespect, mm -hmm. disrespect for a song like that and, and what that song meant. Now, now BG, a couple of things, and it's absolutely correct. Now, a couple of things um, I want to ask you because I'm the, the um, it's blowing up with questions right now. We will try and get to your questions. We are talking about sure. the murder of Sam Cooke. And um, this is with BG Wu, the author who has done so much investigating with it. You have to check her book, both her books. They're so thorough in that. Now, quick question to you, BG. Um, first about your books. What's the difference between volume one and volume two of uh, One More? Oh, gosh. I, well, just to correct you a little bit, I actually had four editions, <laughs> four, four big volumes. Um, and I'll tell you why, and I'm not ashamed to tell you this. When you're investigating, you sometimes get information from somebody that turns out, you later find out, well, you know, something, this was a little bit different than what that person said, because you somebody else has come forward and then you could corroborate that and you could disprove the other person, right? So. It is. It has taken four editions. They're actually working on a fifth right now, which is not. This one's not going to have a lot of changes, but we have found out a few subsequent uh, details. Now, I work with a copyright attorney who's also a private investigator. He gets money back for artists who, you know, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s on, have been ripped off by nefarious managers or record labels. And um, he, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. he was responsible for my being able to meet uh, Fats Domino at his home uh, in New Orleans um, because he got Fats' uh, you know, uh, copyright uh, publishing money back. Um, Fats had been owed money from, um, from some managers and from the record labels as well. And this is a very common thing. And now the copyright attorneys and copyright courts, um, there's kind of a, a knowledge of, uh, of that these shenanigans went on back then. And, and these guys, you know, had sometimes been involved in the mob and most mm -hmm. of the time, in fact, on some yeah, level. And, and, and the interesting thing is that most, um, you know, back then mob ran boxing and it ran music and it ran music oh, yeah. in the movie yeah. industry Sports as well. Sports and entertainment, yeah. That's correct. Now, um, well, BG, yeah. my question to you though, is that, um, now, first thing is that it's been written in many books is that Sam knew it was risky messing around with Alan, Alan Klein because he already had a bad reputation, but he was known for getting people a lot of money in the back royalties. Is that correct? Right, right. Now, well, I don't think he knew. Let me, let me just sort of tidy that up a bit. He knew that Klein was dirty, but he didn't know how deep it went. I don't think he, and most of them didn't. Um, Lana Rawls told me that if she knew what J.W. Alexander did to Sam, Lou would have, I, I'm going to just say this, she won't mind my saying it, it's in the book. She said Lou would have probably gone to prison for killing J.W. because he loved Sam that much. They were so close. What did J.W. do? Well, what J.W. was the one who the bag man from, for Giancana approached because he was close to Sam. He was close to Sam, but he was jealous of Sam at the same time because of women, because of his looks, because of his talent. And he and Sam had had some words over the song Traveling Man. Um, just to tell that story real briefly, uh, Jerry Fuller, who wrote Traveling Man, brought a tape. He had been singing it at the park across the street from the office on Wilshire that Sam shared with Rick Nelson's, I'm pointing like he's right there, but uh, Rick Nelson and he shared office space. They were divided by a cubicle, right? And he brought this tape and Alexander listened to it. And he said, that's a terrible song. And he threw it in the trash can. And he said, come on, I gotta go. And he turned the lights out. And just then uh, uh, Rick's bass player, overheard this. This is a famous Wrecking Crew story that they've told. 
called up Rick Nelson and said, I have your next number one song. Now, when Sam found out about what JW did, he was livid. He said, first of all, that's a great song. He said, second of all, you don't know blank about music. Don't ever make those decisions again. I mean, he was really upset. He said, you didn't even call me. You didn't even give me the opportunity to listen to it. You don't make those decisions. You don't know enough about music. So now here's JW, Sam, you know, basically dressed him down, humiliated him to that extent, perhaps maybe in his mind, I don't know. He saw Sam making more money than he was making. This was actually something that was going on in his inner circle. There was some jealousy. People at his funeral were talking about it, according to somebody I, I interviewed. And uh, he was approached by this bag man. We don't know the amount of money, but the person who told me this is somebody very reputable in business. He's been in the business for a long time and I will not say his name, but <laughs> there's a lot of money. It was more than Alexander had made in maybe several years. He took the money and he called Sam's family. I mean, after Sam died, he went to see them and he apologized to them. And they said, that just doesn't wash because you could have done something. You could have told Sam, you could have come clean. And he never did. Now, now so, um, in your book though, BG, you were mentioning a couple of things that, that really stands out. There's so much to talk about in this short time we have. Oh gosh, now, yes. um, <laughs> now, now, was it J.W. Alexander or was it Johnny Morissette that um, Alan Klein in your book um, put the gun to his head to lure Sam. That was Johnny Morissette, yeah. Okay. yeah. Now, Johnny Morissette, tell everybody who Johnny Morissette was. So Johnny Morissette was this uh, tall, good-looking uh, singer, Caribbean, you know, flashy. And to be honest, I mean, this is going to sound like I'm saying something negative. And it's going to come off that way, but it isn't. Um, both he and Walter Ward of the Olympics were part-time pimps. <laughs> now this was <laughs> just a way that some guys made extra money in the business, you know, when things were slow because they were surrounded by beautiful women and hey, you know. So, and let's face it, from a racial point of view, how many opportunities were there outside of if somebody, you know, if you didn't have a hit record, uh, you're performing, you're not making a whole lot of money. Um, you don't you can't put in the time for a full-time job what opportunities were there for a black man in the 60s and so it it just sort of fits that sometimes these things happened and there's a tie-in with with uh with sam leaving uh uh pjs uh that has to do with him being a pimp um because when he left with Elisa Boyer, whose real name was Crystal Chen Young, and she used a lot of different aliases. She was a call girl. She gave her address as a hotel in Hollywood, which is where call girls stayed. She did not live at the Hacienda. So when she had Sam take her home, that was not home, but he didn't know. What he did know about her and what everybody knew about her is that she was hired by RCA. She was a I'll just say this, she was a backseat girl in the limos, okay? I'll just leave it there. So she um, worked with a lot of the guys in A&R uh, for RCA. And she worked for, as there's some who believe that she worked for uh, the woman uh, at the motel who may have also been a madam in her spare time. So we don't know that. I don't know that for sure, but there is that strong belief and the police seem to know her. So there's that. And so when she's leaving Martoni's um, with Sam, Walter Ward and Johnny Morissette caught Sam and said, hey, she's fine and all, but don't go with her. She works with LAPD. And Walter said, I know my hose, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I know it sounds a little funny now, but Sam just kind of thought, oh, well, you know, they're just uh, hyperbolic, you know. Um, he just sort of played it off. He said, I'm just taking her home. It's okay, you know, wink, wink. And that was really all it was. Now, she had been at PJ's, but when Stan Ross walked in at 10.30 and found Sam at the bar, he was alone. Now, um, 
it's really funny because Al Schmidt is trying to deny that Stan Ross was there. And I said, well, what time did you leave? Well, he left at 10. So I said, well, how would you know who came in at 1030? Right. Well, yeah, yeah, because so, Al, Schmidt, Al yeah. Schmidt actually says he was there with his wife and Sam was with him. But then he got up to uh, when he got up to drink at the bar. Right. But another, right. But another account says that um, yeah. Sam was sitting with them and everybody was coming to him for autographs. All the girls well, he's changed his story more times than I've changed socks today. <laughs> <laughs> um, no he he uh he, it's we we had some words over this on social media and then he decided to block me because you know um he just he can't deal with the truth and possibly mm -hmm. i i can't say because he's still alive so i got to be careful what i say about el schmidt but we'll just mm -hmm. leave it there you know but but now um, um that's the first time i didn't i didn't even know this was in your book it i didn't even, never saw it in your book that that when sam was leaving martoni's with um miss boyer that um johnny morissette and walter stopped him and said no she worked for the LA yeah i think that's in the last uh that was in the last edition and it's it's going to be in the the, the next mm -hmm. one too which will probably will probably be our last one i mean i don't know for sure but it seems mm -hmm. that way now, um, Martoni's, that was located back then. Was that in Hollywood? Where was it located? That was in Hollywood. Um, it was near the studios. And so when Stan Ross went over there, he had just finished recording, I think, at um, Wally Hyder's. Mm -hmm. And he said, I would often stop there for a bite to eat. And late at night, they, they kept their kitchen open. Although Martoni's was, I did a lot of research on Martoni's. It was the place to be at happy hour. The bar was like five deep. It was just jumping with people. And if you want to talk business, you want to be seen and you're an artist, that's, you know, where you would go. And by eight o'clock, people were, you know, just having dinner. People finished dinner, nine, 10 o'clock, the place would be pretty empty by 1030. So, mm -hmm. you know, Stan made perfect sense when he said, well, the place is empty. It's always empty at 1030. And I was, he said, I was just surprised to see Sam alone at the bar. He looked so, and he looked forlorn, like he looked concerned. So at the time that he walked in, Sam knew that his, that he, you know, was having to go through a legal process to extricate Klein, that he was going to have to out him in terms of what he had done, because he knew Klein was behind Klein was whoever he was working for. Klein was behind the uh, the titles of operation being altered and forged. Mm -hmm. He knew that Klein was up to no good because he found out also that the billboard advertising the Copa. Now you knew mm -hmm. this. This was also in his nephew's book. The one that the says billboard, uh, the biggest tip in town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so the billboard advertising the Copa and then he gave him this Rolls Royce. Sam was not a Rolls Royce kind of person. He liked sports cars. He had a Ferrari um, and a Maserati. So he was not a Rolls Royce kind of guy. It was too, that was too showy for him. He didn't like that. He liked to just zoom, you know, mm -hmm. and he liked convertible. So Klein gets him this Rolls Royce and has a photographer there to take a picture of him handing the keys to Sam with his arm around Sam, like, oh, they're the best of buddies. And Sam is sort of, you know, sort of surprised, but he's smiling for the camera. But afterward, you know, told his family, it's like, man, I don't even, I don't know what this guy's doing. So at this point, when he's at the bar at Martoni's, he's put two and two together as to what's going on. He knows that Klein is basically trying to steal his publishing from him. And I think what hurt him is that he realizes Alexander is in on it. He was going to get rid of Alexander, too, from, from uh, what somebody uh, in, close to the family told me. Now, BJ, um, BJ a couple of things really quickly um, in, in those thoughts you were saying. Now, he, Sam was with uh, JW for many years, well before he met Sam Cook. I mean, well before he met Alan Klein. Correct. But when did JW start going getting corrupt? I, I think it was when they crossed over to Pop. And I think um, you know, he was he was managing the labels with Sam. But um if you like one thing that the lawyer and I, my lawyer friend and I did is combing through the documents in the courthouse. I spent three days uh in the basement of the courthouse annex and my attorney friend found even other offices that only attorneys can get into 
and he found that Alexander had stuck his name, somebody else, well, I'll just tell you Zelda did too, okay? Their names are on things that they did not write. I'll just say that. So she can sue me if she wants to. But, but, now, um, but now, BG, a lot of people say that, um, and especially like in this book I was showing you about, they were saying that Sam, um, because he was in a legal um, battle with Art Rupi about who wrote certain songs, he put a lot of songs in other people's names in order just to show that oh, he didn't. Sure. Well, but mostly his family. He did that so that, for one thing, if anything happened to him, they would have something. Um, he put something in his wife's name. Now, you know, she never wrote anything. Um, he put something, a, a couple of things in Elsie's name. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, the one exception might be, and because he has talked about how uh, he had told his, his, his wife at the time, uh, this, this was Charles, um, he and Sam came upon a chain gang when they were Charles was his driver after mm -hmm. that car accident that he had mm -hmm. had years before. He wanted, you know, Charles to be his driver. And they came across this chain gang and Sam just felt so sad for these men. And he started thinking about, I wonder if they have a girl back home and all of this. And Sam gave him a carton of cigarettes. And I think they even gave him whatever they had in terms of food in the car that they asked the the overseer, uh, if they could do that. And he said, yeah, I says, I don't know why you'd want to, but yeah. And, um, and, and I think he and Charles, their conversation, Sam is according to Sam's, uh, girlfriend, he would write all the time. He was always jotting things down on a napkin on a cocktail napkin, piece of paper, whatever he could find a matchbook. Um, he she always is writing. Yeah, he wrote all his songs. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, not everything. I mean, he did standards, too. He, he Canadian Sunset and Moonlight in Vermont. You know, he he did but, those. But what I mean is like the, the chart topping hits he wrote. Right, right. And, 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 and you know, and he and it's a reason why he stashed him, because, again, what he went through with our rupee. But let me um, ask you a couple of things, because um, there's a lot of uh, other things we got to get to. And people are really uh, hitting me up for questions. Um, BJ, we really do appreciate your time on this. Now, um, Sam trusted Charles, his brother, more than Elsie. Is that correct? Elsie was jealous of Sam. I mean, that is something people have told me they observed up close and personal. I talked to a musician from New Orleans who spent a lot of time with Sam uh, every time he came down to the Dew Drop Inn in New Orleans, which is a very popular place. And he just sort of noticed that. And some people in the family, I won't name names, but some people in the family tended to think that, yeah, Elsie kind of wanted to be Sam, wanted to be the singer, the good looking guy and all this sort of thing. Um, and I did he, I mean, he was good looking, but you know, but he wasn't Sam Cook. I mean, there's mm -hmm. only one Sam Cook. Um, and he was closer with Charles than he was Elsie. Family also said that when they got together picnics and things that most of the time Elsie just kind of popped in and popped out. He didn't hang around. Um, Sam and Charles really liked being with family. Mm -hmm. Sam was a family guy, loved his family. He used to take his nieces and nephews to Riverview, the amusement park in Chicago. It's no longer there, but we tell the guy, you know, here's 20 bucks, let him go on all the rides or whatever it was back then. I don't know. But, mm -hmm. um, loved, loved his family. They loved him. Now, BG, um, now Elsie, um, Sam still was such a generous guy that he actually signed, signed Elsie up to his record label and he actually sang background a couple of songs. One of them is uh, Put Me Down yeah. Easy, uh, as well as Suffering. And then even uh, some of the things that Sam had, some of the places Sam had performed, Elsie had performed um, at the same night. So Sam um, was trying to make a way for so many people. Now, with that being said, BG, um, in your book, it's, it's also mentioned that, um, especially at the Copa, Sammy Davis had warned Sam that, listen, when, when the mobsters were coming to visit and they wanted their, their cut, that Sammy Davis would warn them, listen, man, um, these guys mean business and Sam wouldn't yeah. back down. Is that correct? I, I've heard that. Um, I, I think two other people also sort of uh, warned him. One was Ike Turner. And... Uh, he was watching uh, Sam uh, shoot craps with Jackie Wilson and uh, Eddie Fisher was always losing to him. 
that's how we got the Maserati. It was Eddie Fisher's, but um, but he was shooting craps and and Ike Turner told Sam very prophetically, and he told this to somebody I happen to know whose dad knew Sam uh, that. Um, it's not the people you don't know you've got to watch. It's the people closest to you. And, it, you know, I, I think that that was really prophetic where Sam was concerned. And Ike was there from the beginning, right? Whatever you want to say about Ike and Tina. Ike was, I mean, prolific. Rocket 88, he was at the, at the very beginnings of rock and roll. He was one of the first pioneers mm -hmm. uh, before Elvis, before any of those guys. So, um, He'd been around that business and he saw what was really going on. And uh, he tried to warn Sam too. I, I don't know as much about what Sammy Davis Jr. might have told uh, Sam. I, I've heard that from a few people. Um, I don't know for a fact. I mean, I've never interviewed Sammy's family. That would be, that would be something. I should really look into that. That would be good just mm -hmm. to get some verification because it probably did happen, but um, I don't know that for a fact. Now, BG, um, when it comes to um, Sam, now um, break it down to us and we'll take your questions in a moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Now to break it down to me of why they killed Sam and how it actually happened. Very simple, two words, homicide, robbery, or the other way around, robbery, homicide. Mm -hmm. um, the mob, See, the mob, in order to create Vegas, in order to sustain itself, the mob used cash. The mob didn't write checks, <laughs> okay? Everything was laundered money. How do you launder money? You basically enslave somebody and their cash goes to you and you're keeping their mortgage payments. It's really funny because Elsie's home and car are in Alan Klein's name and Abco's name. No, now, why is that? Well, why do you think that is? <laughs> um, I don't mean to sound flippant. I don't mean to sound flippant, but the thing is, um, because LC, like the rest of the family, knew exactly who killed his brother. But why would he and accept any? Why did? Why, here's another question. Why did? Why did Alan Klein pay his attorney six thousand dollars a month for no reason? because his attorney knew what was going on. He but paid hush up. money. Yeah. BG, let's back up for one thing now. You said you said something that was sure. groundbreaking. Now you sure. said LC's um, the Cadillac or his vehicle and all that was in Attico. Attico, was that, that did I say that right? Abco. So in other words, Abco. Abco. Yeah. So Alan B. Klein Company, A-B-K-C-O, -A Abco, yeah. So, so in everything other words, was in Abco's name. In other right. words, Alan Klein was paying LC hush money to keep yep. up quiet about what would happen to his brother. Yep. How could any how could any amount of money shut an, um, your own sibling up about your I own brother? I don't know. Money? I mean, the family, you know, they had such a hard time with that. And they asked him, how can you, you know who he is and what he did? And he said, well, his justification is he said, Sam would want me to have it. And they said, no, it can't be that way, you know, but Sometimes you just, you can't argue with, with relatives. I mean, that's just, he just thought um, somebody was gonna get that money and it was gonna be him. And um, so, yeah, can, you know. I can't press it, <laughs> wow. No, wow. I can't either. You went, well, because we're at the, you know, maybe, I, I don't know. Um, I don't wanna sound nasty here, but I just think it's a matter of ethics and everybody has their own personal ethics. Um, no, I've been asked to ghost. I've been asked to ghost write things, and I won't do it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow! I, now that's something. Ethics. Yeah. Now, well, because if if I'm going to write something, I'm going to put my name on it, and mm -hmm. if I'm going to put my name on it, that means I'm going to open myself up to criticism or whatever, and that's as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, so now, BG, one thing that's interesting yeah. is that um, Lana and she was. I interviewed her on the show. We had a fantastic interview. Yes, she and, she raved about you. <laughs> oh, it was it was incredible. And I so humbly thanks so much for her giving her time. And one yeah. thing she said, she she knew Sam very well. She uh, Lou met Lou introduced him. Um, I don't know back in 1962 or so. Probably yeah. even before then. But the yeah. thing is that she absolutely loved Sam too. And what's what's so uh, uh, harrowing about the interview that we had is that you know Sam was at her house 
you know, the night Sam Cook got, uh, they, Sam was at, you know, Lou's house the night that he was murdered and he was trying to get um, Lou to come out with him, as you wrote in your book as well. Um, yeah. And Lana was saying, you know, that Lou was saying that, now it's an interesting thing, now listen to this because you wrote this in your book and I brought it up to her, but she said it wasn't the case. Now in your book, you said, you wrote that the reason why Lou couldn't go was because Lana recently caught him cheating so um, she was no, giving him a hard time. In my book. No, 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 no. I that didn't was... say that in my book. No, uh, not at all. I, I think. It... I must have. Here, here, let me, let me, let me, let me explain what I did say in that chapter. Okay, go ahead. Sam, the week before, had taken Lana to the Brown Derby for lunch. Mm -hmm. And the three of them, now this wasn't a date or something, you know, they were, they were like brother, sister. They were so close. Although she says, you know, sometimes I think of <laughs> Sam, you know, because it's like he was so irresistible and so flirtatious and so charming. But she said she would never cheat on her husband. She loved her husband. And and she said, and God, I, you know, he'd kill both of us anyway. So, um, but they went to lunch and she, you know, he talked to her about, they had marital troubles at the time, she and Lou. And Lou was a philanderer. I mean, Lou was a serial cheater, but Lou had a lot of problems. The books, the book goes into without making excuses for him. You know, he was the victim of molestation. Um, uh, he uh, didn't know his father. Then he was in that horrific car accident with Sam Cook, where he nearly, he actually was resuscitated on the side of the road. If it wasn't for Sam, he would have died because Sam said he he's going to go to this hospital not that one in other words at that time in the south if a black person was in a car accident they went to the black hospital so when they got to the hospital the white nurses did not want to take care of lou and the doctor said i took a hypocrit hypocritical oath that i'm here to save lives i don't care what skin color anyone is and Sam had already talked to him and he had assured Sam not to worry. He was going to look after Lou and give him the best of care. That's how tight they were. They were like brothers. And so Lana was like a sister to Sam. But Sam had said to her, look, I love Lou, but <laughs> Lou's a dog, you know, and he says, I, I love him to pieces. But, you know, he he's he's got these issues and you're going to have these issues, you know, staying with them. But he told her, if you ever need anything, I'm always here for you. And she just, you know, was in tears because she said he just was such a genuine person, such a good friend. And Lou was on the road um, and there was a snowstorm in Detroit. So he came home. He was kind of, you know, surprised to see um, Sam show up because he thought Sam knew he was on the road. Well, maybe Sam was just coming by to say hi to Lana. Maybe he was coming by to see if Lou was home. You know, who knows? But he had come from the dentist and he said, I'm just dropping by. You guys want to, you know, come out with me? And they said, no, you know, we had plans to go see a movie tonight. And Junior, Lou Junior, was not feeling particularly well. He was like 18 months old or so, and, and uh, which is the same age as his son that had passed. So it was, you know, I... I think he had a vicarious love of his. Lou Jr. was Sam's godson, his only godchild. And um, he sort of had a bad reaction to Sam. He screamed, which Lana said later. She said it was like he sent something, you know. It's a really weird thing because he always loved his, his godfather, uh, Sam. So um, she said Lou always felt guilty that he didn't go with Sam that night. And she always said that you could have ended up like Sam. And then she thought I could have gone with him too, was what if Lou had been on the road and Sam had said, hey, come on out with me tonight. Now, why wasn't he with Barbara? Because <laughs> you were done. They weren't even speaking. They were gonna get a divorce after the holidays. Now, now, now said, speaking of that, uh, BG, yeah. um, I'm gonna ask you about now, um, what was the relationship like with Barbara? Now, Barbara Now, Barbara met Sam, they met each other when, they, when he was still in Chicago, is that correct? They went to high school together. They had a relationship when she was about 14 and, uh, and they had a daughter together and Sam had other children and some of their mothers did not, and they had remarried or had boyfriends and they were jealous of Sam and didn't want uh, 
didn't want Sam around the house. And so he felt bad. He would have his parents bring money and look after the other kids, uh, despite what Barbara says to the contrary. It's just not true. He cared about all of his children, loved all of them. And um, she seems to believe that only, you know, he only cared about her kids and that's not true. And that's what she's told litigators because his children are trying to get what's been rightfully denied them. And even recognition as being Sam's children. Uh, she's tried to just sort of act like they don't deserve to exist, which is a terrible thing. If she ever put herself in their place, but she can't. And she's, she can say what she wants to about me, I don't care, but she's about the money. Is Barbara and, still alive? Oh, yes. <laughs> Now, she's not running the estate. The granddaughter, uh, Nicole, that her name, I think she is, yeah. A very lovely young lady. I've never met her. I've met some of his, his other grandkids. Um, mm -hmm. But, but um, did she's one running thing, the estate, yeah. One thing that's very interesting, I mean, I know we're kind of going running short on time, but BG, um, one thing Lana told me was that on the day, the night Sam Cook um, had gotten murdered, first of all, the... Um, she had received a call at about three in the morning um, and her and Lou were sleeping and it yeah. came from um, Lou's mother who was screaming and saying that Sam had gotten murdered. And, you know, um, Lou woke up when he heard um, Lana speaking to his mom and he didn't know what was going on. So when she told him, they went over to uh, Barbara's house, Sam's house. And right. she, she said that the music was blasting so loud, you could almost hear it from miles away at the house. Yeah, people and, were outside playing his music in their car radios and stuff, yeah. Yes, and Barbara, and, and Lana remember Barbara saying um, they, didn't have to, they didn't have to kill him. And that really got to her in her mind when she heard, she said Barbara was like out of her mind. You know mind. why? Yeah, well, I, I don't want to say, I should be careful. I'm listening, no. Because, no, no. well, because doesn't that, what do you mean they didn't have to kill him? That means you thought they were just going to rough him up? You know what? So what is what is she saying in that remark? <laughs> she also was at the repast and the family says she asked, did anybody say that they saw my car? Did anybody say that they saw my car? She asked that like in this very nervous tone several times. So there is there is a widespread belief that Barbara knew what was going to happen. How did they know where Sam was? How did how is it that Boyer went from and this is what I pose in my book. She was like a human tracking device. She went from Martoni's to PJ's. Right? How does that happen? She didn't drive there. Who was there? Pete Bennett. Who was Pete Bennett? He was Alan Klein's partner at Liberty Distribution. Who was it that got caught in the 80s with $30,000 of Beatles promo records that he was in the cash under the table, delivering them to Klein's house? Pete Bennett. That's who the Fed snapped. And he spilled the beans and told them exactly what, what he and Klein were up to. This is what Klein did. Wow. This okay. is what, that's why Sam, you see, Sam was very smart because he, he knew where every penny was going when it came to distribution. Mm -hmm. he, he was looking out for the Allen Kleins of the world. He already knew what they did. So BG, um, now, why is it we don't hear or see Sam cook movies or hear his music played? Because um, Alan Klein owns, Abco owns not only the rights to the music, as does Barbara, because they forged a deal at the repast, speaking in a, in a closed door room for an hour. So nobody else, everybody else was cut out. She dissolved Sam's labels, SARS and Derby. Klein took over the publishing. One very telling thing that's in my book is a picture of the original single of Chain Gang in which Sam and his brother Charles are both listed as songwriters, right? In Alan Klein's probate papers of the Sam Cooke catalog, it just says Sam Cooke. So they cut Charles out. They cut the family out of everything. J.W. Alexander's name shows up <laughs> on things he never wrote. Zelda's name is on a few things. It's just a very interesting state of affairs as to who was running things and who was getting what. And then Zelda was working at Liberty afterwards. She claimed that Klein fired her, but then why did she go to work for him at Liberty? But now, now BG, what would you think um, that Zelda had something to do with it? She loved Sam to death. And, she, and in many books you see, she's stating that, that Sam- She said that, she loved Sam to death. 
but she had she was the one that um you know when Alan wanted all of the uh copyrighted material sent to him in New York she said oh no oh no and as many she says she said that we don't know see we don't know because I thought that too because I've met her talk with her right I thought this too she told me she was at the courthouse after the uh uh, the inquest, the autopsy inquest, that was a sham, right? Where the judge is in and out and that's it. There was no evidence. There was no clothing. There was nothing. There was no, there was no investigation of his murder whatsoever. The whole thing was a sham. And I've had LAPD tell me that. And they've told my attorney that. They said it was poorly investigated. <laughs> my attorney said, what do you mean? It wasn't investigated at all. <laughs> it just wasn't. Well, BG, and one thing you, how do you have a murder scene, you don't have a chalk drawing, you don't have police tape, you don't have anything, right? And then one thing you and, mentioned and, in your book as well was that in court, um, first of all, the, uh, Bertha, Bertha uh, Franklin was able to wear shades, and so was Elijah Boyer. And so, uh, 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 not, oh yeah, I guess Bertha did too. Yeah, yeah who used to wear sunglasses in a courthouse? Yeah, there was both video of showing footage of them both wearing shades, yeah. and then yeah. you, and then also you mentioned the book that Alan Klein's people escorted them out. Yes. Now, how, how does, does that happen? happen? How do, in what in what parallel universe <laughs> is that okay? Right, <laughs> like you're you're with you're with the woman who claims your client kidnapped, raped, and, 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 you know, abducted her to this motel <laughs> and you're, and you know, she's a hooker <laughs> and you're with her. <laughs> it's, it's, it's too fantastical, but you see one thing I say in my book over and over again, it was 1964. He was black. She was white. That Say tells no you all you need to know about justice in America in 1964. That is correct. That is correct. Now, um, one last question to you, BG. I'm so appreciative appreciative of all that you're well, sharing. I, I could do this for hours. <laughs> yeah, I know, and it's and it's it's incredible and so insightful yeah. about all the things you're sharing and educating people on because you know people don't really explore the um, facts of things. They just accept what people say. But when you look at this story, you don't even have to look too very too deep to see all the contradictions right. in it right. as well. Right. Now, where does Bobby Womack fit in all this? Well, he <laughs> um, he was a teenager. He was part of the Valentinos. Uh, Sam had discovered them in Cleveland. Their father was a minister like Sam's dad. And, their, and he, Sam went to their father and said, I'd like to record them and have them cross over to Pop. And just like his dad, their dad gave that blessing. They weren't even sure they wanted to do that. And they were very successful. And Bobby, as you know, was quite talented. Um, I always love 110th Street to this day. I think of that scene in Jackie Brown. I just love that song. Incredible song. But uh, <laughs> there are a lot of things about Bobby. But the thing about Bobby is that I think that his family believes, and I and I see this, and I really see this. She was 30, Barbara was 33 years old at the time. Here's a teenage young man that your husband, he's your husband's protege. How do you end up? seeing him. Now, granted, their marriage was over and they had separate apartments. Sam had an apartment on Santa Barbara Street in LA and she was staying down the road from the Hacienda. She was also dating a bartender across the street at that time, but their marriage was pretty much over, right? And so, you know, she had been with Bobby at, at this time also. So I don't know if she's going out with other people while she's going, Bobby, I don't know but she was dating Bobby. And then he shows up at the funeral, famously wearing Sam's clothes, driving his car, which you know, everybody thought, can you, can you be in any more poor taste than that? Um, <laughs> so, so but, he, but he was a kid, but I, I, I will give him this. She should have known better. He was a kid and they right. couldn't even get married until I think three months after Sam's passing because he wasn't old enough and his parents wouldn't sign off on it. But BG, like what, now was she dating uh, Bobby while Sam was still alive or that started yes. after he? Yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is BG Rule. She, again, is the author of One More River, The Redemption of Sam Cook. Um, you get both, I get as many copies as you can. They're all on Amazon. You see it on your monitor there. Excellent and very investigative. Something that she did on that, that really I didn't, we didn't discuss um, on this interview, but she traced Alan Klein 
relation all the way to Lee Harvey Oswald, did you not? Well, I was drawing some parallels. I won't say that it was the same thing, but there are some very interesting parallels mm -hmm. very um, much so. now, now, between you... the cover up of the Kennedy assassination and mm -hmm. Sam Cooke. I, I'm not saying that there's any correlation between but it, it, it was a fascinating the way you did it. Um, you just go very, very deep in it. There's so much more to be talked about about this um, as we uh, seek out more answers with this. Um, so many people have loved Sam Cooke. So many people still love him. He's a timeless individual. Um, for those who are new fans to him, just check out uh, You Send Me. Sam is much bigger than just a change is going to come. A lot of the new generation I, just sure, hears the change is going to come. Can I say one thing about change real quickly that sure. I didn't mention that's really important? The reason the reason um, he didn't sing it on the Tonight Show for a, another fact is that Johnny Carson's son, who I talked to on the phone, told me that very seldom did any singer sing a second song on that show. It, it had to be like a Tony Bennett or something like that. Johnny Carson never heard Sam Cooke until that night. And that night when he heard him sing Basin Street Blues and he did this great job and this great arrangement, he turned to... Uh, somebody on the, I think it was Ed McMahon, and he said, wow, he's really good, isn't he? But there was no, he was not going to have him. He didn't even have him come over to the to the, to the couch like he would have some singers. He right, just but, said, but, great job. Yeah. But, th but there's a video out there, and I saw it uh, a couple of days ago, where um, Johnny Carson did say that Sam is going to come out and sing a second song. Because he said to him, are you, you're just going to stand there the rest of the show, Sam. <laughs> 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 Sam will be back, of course, in the show. He sings well, doesn't he? Nice. And stand out there, and he was joking, and then he said, "Sam would be no, back." No, I don't. I don't think he. He's no. He said he didn't say. Are you? If, if that's what it says, that's doctored because the original video that I heard, he's laughing at Sam. He, Sam is like hanging out with the guys in the band, and they're mm -hmm. all like, you know, like we would high five each other after doing something really well. So they're just kind of like giving each other kudos because it had gone so well. Right. Uh, Basin Street is a tough song to sing, and and he had these fantastic arrangements. If you, if you it was beautiful, that. and then he sang it on a Michael Douglas show too. Beautiful. Yes, yes, yes. Sure he's eight, see now there he sang a couple of songs because Mike Douglas was more colloquial. They mm -hmm. sat around on on chairs and they yes they, yes you know yes, he did. it was absolutely yeah. great. Because they start off with an interview and then he started singing in the um right. he started sitting in the chairs yeah. and singing it. Howard that Keel all draped all over him like a cheap suit. <laughs> <laughs> now one thing one thing that is also um not true about the uh one night in Miami is that the, the movie is making it seem like Malcolm X inspired Sam Cooke to make one um no, not at all. It That's was seeing true. Bob Dylan, it was seeing Bob Dylan, the March on Washington. Sam couldn't get out of his contract. He, he, he booked the tour, he couldn't get out of it, he'd be sued. And he was heartbroken. He would have loved to have been there when he saw Odetta, he just fell out like, oh my God, this is, look at everybody's here. But when he heard Dylan sing Blowing in the Wind and he, he's like, you know, the white man this, singing white kid, this, this white kid singing this song about something we're feeling, you know, as a black man. So he met Dr. King at the Atlanta airport shortly thereafter, as fortune would have it. And he promised him, that not only was he going to do a song for him and dedicate the proceeds to SCLC, he was going to do a compilation album and put other artists' songs on there and they could sell the album and make even more money. Now that was a project he never sought to fruition, but Harry Belafonte did do such an album. Well, uh, BG, um, we're out of time. I thank you so much for being on the Sherrard Show tonight, um, giving us some very much insight. Will you come again on the show and be a guest? I would love to. This was so much fun. <laughs> so much. Do I need to call Joe Biden to schedule you on the show? Uh, no, no. I, I'm, I'm sure we can do this without Biden's <laughs> approval. <laughs> I might have to call Joe Biden and see if we if BG's allowed to come on because she's so busy. <laughs> but but blessings to you. Hope you have a wonderful uh, 2021. And uh, definitely you, keep too. writing out those wonderful books. Get both get all the copies of the uh one more river the redemption of sam cook but also well, we're get... actually to, to tell you the truth we're sold out of those but we it's on kindle but i'm working on a fifth copy which i should have in the next couple of months wow so be on the lookout for that but we've got the the, the lou rawls book yes the love is a hurting thing get that as well well i'm sure that's it for me you have a great evening you be safe next episode of sherrard show we're going to have mr master p stop by to talk about his new business endeavors i'm sherrard see you next time bye bye thank you for joining us on this episode of the sherrard show if you like additional information about our episodes 
you can log on to the Sherrod Show Dot com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube video, subscribe to our newsletter at Essence Television Networks at gmail.com. If you would like to get information to the host, Sherrod, you can email him at thesherrodshow.com. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.